I cannot make a significant difference in this world. And I refuse to believe that my actions can impact the lives of those around me. I know without a doubt that God has not given me anything to offer. It's foolish to think that what I do with my time and resources matters. I possess something the world needs is a lie. My life is of little consequence. All of this is true unless I allow God to reverse my thinking. My life is of little consequence is a lie. I possess something the world needs. What I do with my time and resources matters. It is foolish to think that God has not given me anything to offer. I know without a doubt that my actions can impact the lives of those around me. And I refuse to believe that I cannot make a significant difference in this world. All right, welcome to The Sound today. What's up, everybody? Good to see you here. Our extra of sleep, you all look good today. And if you uh, sleep during this message, you must be resting in the arms of Jesus. So anyway, I want to say hello to all those behind the computer screen on live stream, as well as any first-time guests. Can you do me a favor and give it up for all of our first-time guests and those behind the screen? That, that was wimpy. Come on, you got an hour of extra sleep, a little better than that. Way to go. All right, we're in this series. If I were a rich man, and kind of the rhetorical answer to that theme is, y'all are rich, every one of you. And there's good news. There's good news, and the good news is you are all rich. When you're comparing yourself to all those around the world, each and every person in this room, y'all very rich. Now, the bad news with this series is Y'all are very rich. <laughs> and, and with a lot of blessing comes great responsibility. And so we're in this series, If I Were a Rich Man. And so God expects more from us. The scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. And could you do me a favor and pull out of your worship guides these notes and as I like to say, as you're taking notes, and some people say if you're taking notes, but <laughs> I'm just going to assume today. And what we're going to do today is talk about a different way of being rich. And maybe you've never thought of it this way before. And we're going to begin by reviewing this passage, these verses that we've been reading each week. Maybe you've got them memorized by now, but it's 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. It's in your notes, and it's where Timothy is being kind of taught by this master, mentor, pastor. He writes this epistle, which is a letter, a pastoral letter, and he tells, he tells Timothy this, that rich people are actually very needy, <laughs> that they need something, and what they need is for somebody to have some guts and tell them a few things. And so I'm hiding today behind these scriptures. And this is what he says. He says, command those who are rich. That would be us. It says, command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. Now these verses aren't in red. Jesus did not speak them. But they should be red, white, and blue in our Bibles because everybody, especially in the nation's capital here in Northern Virginia, we are the ones that Paul was talking about. And he says, command them that are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor, which is so easy to do, to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope where? put their hope in God. And this next part is so powerful. It says, who richly provides us with everything for what? For our enjoyment. So we're going to take a little bit of the guilt away. Listen, if you love Jesus, if you've given your heart to him, you are one of his kids. And hey, he wants you to enjoy some of his stuff. But it goes on and it says this, but command these rich people to do what? To do good and to be rich, and how are they to do this? Now, I want you to underline this next phrase. He says this, he says, to be rich in good deeds. Underline that phrase, to be rich in good deeds. Be generous, be willing to share. And We talked about that last week. Actually, we talked about kind of the why behind the what 
But today we're going to talk about how to truly be rich. And the scripture tells us that we're to be rich in what? Being generous, being willing to share. We talked about that last week in the rich man's will. But now he says, if you're truly going to be rich, then what you need to do is to be rich in doing good deeds. And have you ever asked yourself, what would happen? What would I do if I just suddenly inherited a zillion dollars? And I know people have talked to me about that. They've played that game in times past. And usually, probably because I'm the pastor, they'll say things like, why, pastor, I would buy a big building for the sound to meet in. Wouldn't that be great? And then they say things like, I'd pay off my parents' mortgage because I'm such a good kid. And I'd do all of these acts of philanthropy and good works and all of that. And when we have this discussion, you've played that game before, am I the only one? <laughs> I've dreamed of that. But very rarely when people play this little game of accounting, do they account for what Jesus called the deception of riches. That really when people actually become rich, it becomes easy to become me-centered rather than other-centered. In fact, there is a show on TLC. It's a series called uh, Lottery Changed My Life. And this phenomena is so great that they have a weekly series on people that have won the lottery only to chronicle week after week how they really became losers. They lost their family. <laughs> they became penniless in the end. Any, anybody seen one of those packages before? Now, Paul is actually saying this. Write this in your margins, if you would. That what Paul is saying is, if you're rich, then don't miss how to be rich. If you're rich, or if you are rich, then don't miss how to be rich. That really the best way to truly be rich is not, not only be generous and willing to share, but that you would do good, that you would do good deeds. So let me ask you this question. Since we've all decided, and, and kind of by this point, you all agree probably that y'all are rich. The question is, how many of you are rich in good deeds. How many of you are middle class in being helpful and generous to others? Some of you maybe even are poor in good deeds and that you've forgotten that the best way to be rich towards God is by helping and doing good for others. So write this in your margins. Because I have more, I will give more and do more. Because I have more, I will give more and do more. So we're going to be talking about, and that's what we're talking about this morning, doing good works. But before we go on with this message, you cannot miss this foundational principle. And if you miss this, you're going to miss the whole boat on this whole message, and it's actually our first point. And today I want to talk to you about three principles in doing good good works and doing good deeds. You need to have these three principles lived out in your life. And the first one is this. It's a fill-in for you. We need to understand that we are not saved by, by, and that's your fill-in, by our good works, but we're saved for good works. And this is awesome. That God, does not come in, that, that God doesn't come into our lives as a result of all the good things that we do. No, we are saved. We have right relationship with God so that he would impact our lives and do good things. Now, we're not made right by God for those good works, uh, by those good works, but we're transformed by God to do these good works. Here's how Paul described it. It's Ephesians chapter 2. It's in your notes. It says this, For it is by grace, you can underline, circle that, that you've been saved through faith that this is not of yourself. And this is the good news. The Bible says it's a gift of God and that it's not, and underline this, it's not, it's not by works so that no one can boast. In other words, <laughs> Now, now that we've become Christians, we don't go around saying, hey, look at me, I am so righteous. 
God's made me right, and it stinks for the rest of you. I'm going to heaven and not you. <laughs> it says that we are saved. It's not by works, but it's by his grace that no one can, say, that no one can boast. And then it goes on to say this, for we are God's handiwork. Another version says that we're his masterpieces, that he put you in Christ to do these good works. In fact, when you gave your life to Christ, you were placed in him. In fact, you were placed in a body. Why? Because in that body, together, we could do great things in and for and through the church, through him. We're the body of Christ. Everybody got that. Now, this is mind-blowing. It says, we are created to do good works, which God prepared. In fact, this is, how many of you know, we just had the uh, anniversary of the Back to the Future flux capacitor. Well, that's this verse right here. It says that these good works that we're to do, God planned them well before we were ever born, that we would do these things and glorify him. That is absolutely, to me, mind-blowing. He prepared these good works for us to do and make a difference. And we say it around here all the time. In fact, it's the vision of this church that what God's will is for your life is that he wants you to be saved for you to find God. And that's a continual process. He wants you to be healed and he wants you to find freedom and healing in your life. And then he wants us to find fulfillment. And listen, we'll never be fulfilled in our life by piling up all of these possessions. We're not going to find out that could be thrilling for a moment, but you'll never be so thrilled in your life, something that would be a consistent fulfillment, as finding out what that purpose is that God created in Christ for you before you were ever born. Now, that's what we want to do, and and here's these three principles. And now here's the first one. I think I I told you the intro was the first one, and you caught me on that if you're taking notes. Now, here's the first one in your good deeds. My good deeds should always point to God and not to me. That's number one. In your doing of good deeds, make sure that they're not to be pointing to you, to me, but they point to God. Now, Jesus said it this way in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, Jesus said, let your light shine before others. Now, notice what he did not say. He did not say so that they would hear your words. What he's talking about here is our actions. What he said is so they may see your good deeds. It's not so that they would see what you do and say, wow, you're such a great guy. You're a wonderful lady. No, it is so that they would see your good deeds and that they would reflect and that people would give glory to God in heaven. For those good deeds. Now, here's the deal. When Jesus said, let your light shine, he wasn't talking about what you say. He was talking about what you do. Have you ever considered in your life that your actions may be the only sermon that, that some people get a chance to, to hear? In fact, I believe that our good deeds are like that push notification (laughs) that many of us try to turn off on our phones. It's a push notification alerting people that we're doing good things for, that there is more goodness of God available for them to download. Now we say, (laughs) we say in our good deeds, what we're doing is we're reflecting to God. We're not saying what a great guy I am, but what we're saying is I'm reflecting God's glory. Now last week I talked to you about how my alcoholic dad gave his heart to Jesus and then became uh, really the most generous person I've ever met. And it's interesting when you watch someone give their life to Christ that what they do is they go through this process where they begin making God number one in their life and then they take a look at their family and they get that into order and then they align their job and their work with the priorities of the Lord and they They find out how to be a generous person. 
and then God gives them a ministry. And when my dad first gave his life to God, he got his life right with the Lord, and then he began looking at his family. And now I'm a teenager. And he began praying prayers like, how can I impact my boy for God? Now, about the time my dad got his life straightened out, I was not interested in spending time with him. I was interested in uh, spending time with her. Now, she wasn't interested in spending time with me yet, but I was out chasing, <laughs> chasing girls. And so my dad actually prayed. He said, Lord, what can I do to spend more time with my boy? And what God did is gave him an idea for a part-time job. And me and my best friend, Jeff Hart, were his first two roofers. And so he would go out, find roofs that needed to be done, and he started this business roofing. And interestingly enough, his motivation was to disciple us, and both of us ended up being pastors, by the way, as odd as that is. And what I learned through all of this is that when your motivation is basically others and not yourself, what happens is that God begins to prosper. And over time, what happened was what started as a business to get two boys out of trouble on the roof ended up growing to 120 people. Interesting. And then my dad started leveraging this business. Now, let me say this, that the business was not a charity. But what my dad would do, and I watched him in this example, was he allowed God to lead him in how he was to leverage his business for the Lord. And I can't tell you the times that God moved upon him, and there, in, in probably three occasions, there were different single moms in our church, and he would send their child to private school so they could get a good Christian education. Or there were other times that I couldn't believe it because you should have seen what I was driving, but he gave away a couple vehicles to ministries, and then there were times when he would write a check or even give the pastor a little handshake with a some money and say, I know that you know who needs to be blessed with this. I saw him leverage this business and his life in this way. And oftentimes God would impress upon his heart and I'd be driving around with him and he would go and, and these people would have a leaky roof. And so what he would do is he would come off the ladder, he would tell the people, hey, this is your problem. You've got a, a leaky roof and here's the deal. I will fix it for free if you'll go to my church two weeks in a row. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how many people were added to the kingdom and added to our church because he made that deal. Now, it would have been worth uh, hundreds of dollars, but probably only 15 minutes of his time. I remember um, a couple that uh, had a great, great grandparents that were quite elderly. And these, this couple came to my parents and said, would you fix my great-grandparents' roof? And we go there, and they can't afford anything. They're on subsistence living, on Social Security, check to check. And we go over there, and the roof does not need fixed. They need a new roof. I mean, the whole thing is caving in. You walk into their living room, and because of all the water, it's just a total cave-in. And so what my dad did and what we did was we got the distributor of the shingles and all the materials to donate materials, write it off. Trisha's brother spent a Saturday with a couple other guys, fixed the roof, and we fixed it for free. And what the cool thing is, the end of that story is that couple ended up planning a church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Now, I tell you that I caught, I caught generosity from my dad and here I am a 16 17 year old boy up on the roof and uh, my friend Jeff pastor Jeff now and I were roofing hot hot summer day this elderly woman's house and uh, I caught generosity from my dad and she had an extra problem or, with her chimney and so we got off the roof and I wanted to figure out how we could help her she couldn't she could not afford to have that fixed as well and as we were speaking to this elderly woman, on her arm she had just the, the, the most terrible psor psoriasis. And as we talked to her about her chimney, she's just scratching, and it was, it was really horrible. And so right there, 
I don't know which one of us said it, either it was Jeff or myself, but we said, ma'am, can we pray for you? And right there, we were, we were dirty as can be, but we laid hands on her with tar all over our hands, and we prayed the, the, the short 17-year-old prayer. And can I tell you what happened? In the name of Jesus, she was healed right before our eyes. And I say all of that to say that God couples good deeds not so he would say, look at these guys, they're great guys. No, we're actually duds. But what we're doing is, because we love and serve Jesus, we're reflecting the glory of God and we're pointing to him. Now you see, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved for good works. And I believe that God actually prepared these things for us to do beforehand. Now, here's the second point if you're taking notes. First one is, they don't point to me, they point to God. Now, here's one that's really, really important. The second principle is this. It's a fill-in for you. My good deeds must not, excuse me, my good deeds must help others in a way they need it, not in the way I want to give it. For instance, if you know someone whose family is about to go homeless, as Pastor Mark, when we planted this church, downturn of the ec economics, he was ready to lose his home, it would be crazy for us to go to Pastor Mark and say, hey, I see that you and your family ha have struggles, but you know what I'd like to do? I'd really like to bless you, feel like God's moving upon my heart. I'd like to give you some chocolate chip cookies and We'd like to bake them for you. In fact, I don't bake, but my wife, I'm sure, would love to do that. And, and it would just make my heart feel so good. I know this is crazy, but that I would give you these chocolate chip cookies. No, we offered for him to come into our house. And God did a miracle. He's got a better home than you or I, most likely. Now, that's often, though, what we as Christians do. We offer crazy help. Now, look at this next scripture verse in Acts 10, 38. We need to give help in the way that people need it. And here's what the scripture says. Jesus went around doing what? The Bible says he was doing good. And so we need to be rich in good deeds, just like Jesus. And Jesus went around doing good. And what else did he do? He was healing all of those that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So he was healing those that were oppressed by the devil helping them in the way that they needed to be helped. And I think, and I know that it's true, that sometimes we Christians help people in ways that aren't very helpful. In fact, I actually believe that we can help people in ways that can be harmful. And it's oftentimes because we're well-meaning. Now, I know that I studied uh, for the ministry in, in Minneapolis. I lived in the inner city of Minneapolis. Scary scary place with homeless Norwegians, basically. <laughs> and, and, and I know that oftentimes I had these homeless people that would come up to us and they would say, hey, I need some money. I'm hungry. And I knew that if we were to just give them money, we would feed their addiction. And so instead, what we would say, hey, let's go to the corner store together and then we would eat together and that would give me a chance to pray with them, to speak to them about Jesus, and point them to a hopping church in downtown Minneapolis. So we did what Jesus did, that he did what was good, and he wanted to help them be free. Now write this in your margin. True help, <coughs> true help is help that brings freedom. True help is help that brings freedom freedom. Being, being rich in good deeds means that we don't just give a handout, but what we want to do is give a hand up and actually help them in their lives. And I said uh, just moments ago that when my dad gave his life to Christ, he got right with God, then he got his family straightened out, got me out of trouble, and then he began aligning his business, and then God gave him a ministry. God gave him a ministry. It was actually a small group that would help others that were caught up in addictions find Jesus and be set free. And I remember one night we received a phone call because of this ministry from a lady that uh, was in her early 20s in Texas. She ran away from the town in which we lived in outside of Chicago, and she was 
a go-go dancer and a prostitute, and she got hooked on drugs, and there she was on the other side of that phone call crying and asking for my dad to do two things. Could you talk to my dad? He's written me off. He says that I'm dead to him. And then could you pay for my way home? And so my dad arranged for her to come home. And then he called her back. And he said, I, I did all the arrangements, but now you owe me. And she says, uh, what do you mean? This, Peggy says, what do you mean I owe you? I don't have any money. And he says, well, you owe me, right? And she said, yes. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to open up the yellow pages when we get off the phone. And I want you to call the first Assembly of God, that's the church we went to, Assembly of God Church, you can find, and call the pastor and ask him this. What is the plan? What's the plan? Hey, don't ask any questions. You just do this. <laughs> so she hung up. She called the pastor. What's the plan? She came into the office. He led her to the Lord. And can I tell you, she didn't come home? Not for months and months. Why? Because she wanted to stay there and got discipled. When she came home, she joined in with my dad's ministry. And then she adopted a couple children from the women that were in her troubled past, and she raised them for Jesus. Why? Because she was helped in the way that she needed help. True help is that which brings freedom. Write this in your margins. We haven't really helped until we begin the extra mile. We haven't really helped until we begin the extra mile. And what my desire is for the Sound Church is that we would be a church that goes the extra mile. You might have heard that phrase, going the extra mile, and you may not even know where it comes from. But where it comes from, and I'm going to show you now, is from these next verses in your notes. It's Matthew 5.41, and this is what Jesus said. He says, if anyone forces you to go, how far, if anyone forces you to go a mile, then how, for, how far should you go? He said, you should go two miles. Well, what is he talking about here? Well, in the days of Jesus in which he walked this earth, Roman soldiers had it under their legal authority to have anyone they choose carry their gear for a mile. In other words, they could say, Hey, you, over there, yeah, you, come here, pick that up. And they would have to, by legal authority, carry that uh, uh, one mile in the Roman days was 1,000 steps. And so you were asked, by legal authority, you had to carry it. And I can imagine, 999, 1,000. And what Jesus is saying here is, because you serve me, because you're going to reflect my glory, even though they don't ask you, you are to carry it an extra mile that you're to go extra and that's what we're going to do as a church in fact on your seats each and every one of you I've given probably two of these and there's more available out as you enter and leave this facility but I don't know how this is going to play out in your life but these are how these cards are designed I don't know if maybe you're uh, maybe you're making or maybe you're to get a meal for someone in your neighborhood that just had a baby. And so maybe you'd be like me and you're in the drive-thru. <laughs> and instead of uh, just supersizing it, maybe you get a, a main dish and a salad and you get a dessert, you go the extra mile and you get a happy toy. And when you give this gift, what you do is you place this on that as you go the extra mile and you connect your good deeds with glorifying God. Or maybe you're babysitting for someone in your neighborhood and God moves on your heart and you say, okay, this one's on me. You don't have to pay me at all. But then as you're watching these kids, mind you, your only task is really to make sure that they don't kill themselves and they get to bed sometime, maybe just as the lights are seen coming up in the driveway, but you decide to go the extra mile and so you pick up the toys and you wash the dishes and when you're done washing the dishes, you take one of these puppies and you put it on top. Or maybe you're in the Starbucks line 
and all you need to do is pay for yours, but you give this to the person at the window and you say, hey, let me pay for the person behind me. And so we'll glorify God through our good deeds. Now here's the third one. And it's my very favorite thought. And I pray that it inspires you. In fact, I I pray that it puts a, a fire in your gut to glorify God in his church and, and sometimes for his church and through his church. But here it is, it's your, your fill-in. That my good deeds will glorify God through his church, through his church. In fact, Hebrews says it this way. It's in your notes, it's uh, chapter 10. It says, and let us consider how we may do what? How we may spur one another on toward, and here it is again, you can underline it. It says, towards what? Towards love and good deeds. And how can we spur one another on? He says, not by giving up meeting together, as quite honestly is the habit of many, but by encouraging one another. Now, I live in Fauquier County. It's hard to believe I have all my teeth. But (laughs) but oftentimes, oftentimes, on my road, Germantown Road, it happened yesterday. We heard the trumpets, do, 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 and they were having this fox hunt, and we heard the dogs, hur, 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 and all of these people in red vests, and they're mounted on these horses. And then every once in a while, you, you'll hear, Hee-yah! and I don't know much about horses at all, but I do know this, that there's a little thing called a spur, it's got little jagged edges on it, and the only thing I understand about it is, is that it gives the horse a little kick in the butt. And what does the Bible say? How can we spur one another on towards love and good deeds? It's when we get together here on Sundays. (laughs) When we gather together in our small groups, what do we need to do sometimes? Give an encouraging kick in the butt (laughs) that we say, how can we do more? How can we serve our church? What can we do to bless one another? What is God doing In my heart, what is that way that he wants to leverage my life to do something in the church or for the church or through the church that I can bring glory to God? And so we're not going to be below average givers. And Can I be honest with you today that um, (laughs) we're all part of the church, you and I? And I actually believe that, um, that the church is the hope of the world. That this world is never going to get right by the government getting it right. You might have your political uh, ideas, but all of them come in a crash course with men's sinfulness and selfishness. The fact is that... Uh, The church is the hope of the world. That God put in each and every one of us a spiritual gift. And when that spiritual gift is activated, that when when the Holy Spirit moves on you and he gives you that little nudge, when we spur one another on towards love and good deeds, that the Bible says that all the needs are met. In fact, look at this next verse. In Acts 4, 33 and 34, they were in an economic downturn in the Bible. They were in a depression. I don't know what what you actually think about our economy. Most people, you watch the news, they're a little concerned about the future. Have you noticed that? I don't know how long we'll exist the way that we are. We're, We're pretty prosperous, you know that, right? seems that our country's gotten off track. I don't know how long the blessings will be on us. You know what you find in the scripture? The Bible says that it talks about Cornelius. He's in the book of Acts and it says that he was a Greek. He was lost. He was a Roman citizen anyway. And the Bible says that God moved on his heart. Why? Because his good gifts and his good deeds and his acts towards the poor came up as an aroma to God. 
The Bible talks about that when we're believers, that when we give, what do we do? We store up riches in heaven. Isn't that cool? It's almost like, you know, you know that this world goes through evaporation and sooner or later the storm clouds come. And when the storms come, the rain comes down. I want my good deeds. I want all my generosity to kind of be stored up here so that when there's a rainy day, what's raining down on me is the blessings of God. Well, here in the scripture, the Bible says that the people were so crazy during this depression that they actually brought their gifts to the, to the pastors. And they said, here, I've sold what I have and you distribute them. And then the Bible says this, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that, all, that there were no, <laughs> no needy persons among them, that each and every one of their needs were met. And listen, when we live as generous people, when we leverage all that we are to glorify God, the result is that there's no needy people among us, that when we live this way, we become rich in what matters most. Now, here's your last fill-in, and then we'll pray. I've given you an if-I-were-a-rich-man statement every week, and here's this week's. And I'll end with this. If I were a rich man statement, here it is, last fill-in, then we'll pray. God has blessed me with more than I need so I can glorify God by going the extra mile. Would you bow your heads? Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you that you've blessed us, that you've called each and every one of us, Lord, to glorify you and that we've not been saved by the, by the good things that we do. But Lord, you have transformed our life so that we in turn would do good things. Lord, I pray that you would empower our church, that you would empower the sound. Lord, that we would bless people where we live, that we would bless people all over the world. God, I pray that you'd help us to point to you, that we wouldn't point to ourselves, Lord, that we would meet people in the way that they need it and not the way that we want to give, but that we glorify you, God, and that we do it as the church, through the church, to make your name known. Lord, I pray that we would make your name famous. So right now, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, some of you may realize as we've spoken and read the word and, and look to what Jesus has said today to us. Some of you may be realizing that you're really middle class <laughs> in your good deeds and that God's got good things for you to do in advance. That, that you're a part of this church and he wants to move upon you to maybe serve through the church or with the church and be rich in good deeds. And I'm going to pray that God gives you a sensitive heart to see the deeds that he's prepared for you in advance to do and, and that when you see them that you're going to say this one's mine. I'm not going to let this one go but I'm going to let you use me Lord to bless others. And be so thankful that God's going to empower you. Right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed would you just lift up your hand if you say that's me I I need to be rich in good deeds. Would you just lift up your hand? I got my hand raised. I want to be rich in good deeds. In fact, could you do me this favor? Maybe you might need to peek for just a moment, but grab this little card that was on your seat, or maybe you've set it next to you. And I want you to think about someone that you need to bless. Or if you can't think of someone, I want you to begin praying that God would lay the right people upon your heart. And I want to pray for you. Just hold that up to the Lord right now and let's pray together. God, I thank you for a church filled with people that want to be rich in what matters. And God, I, I, I pray, Lord, that you would activate, that you would let loose. 
Lord, that you would do as Paul talked to Timothy, Lord, that you would stir up the gifts, Lord, by your spirit that are within us, Lord, that you would be so good, Lord, in pouring out your blessing upon us that it would spill out to a dry and thirsty world, Lord, that we would bring a tsunami of life wherever we touch, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Lord, for these people that we're going to bless, Lord, I pray that the connection would be made between the good gift and the glory to God in the name of Jesus. Now with every head bowed and eyes closed just for a moment. Listen, we're not saved because we do anything good. Listen, God comes into our lives because he needs to transform our lives. In fact, the Bible says that each and every one of us are powerless to live for him, that we're powerless to do good, that each and every one of us are sinners, and that's why we need him. And so with your heads bowed, your eyes closed, the fact is that the sin in our lives separates us from a loving God. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you're here today and you realize that you need to start where it matters most and that you need a relationship with God. If that's you this morning, listen, God wants to forgive you. He wants to transform your life. He wants to put the Spirit of God in you and make you completely new. And so Jesus was perfect in every way. and That's why he died on the cross. So he would take our place and that we would reach out to him, that he would come into our life and transform us, take away our mistakes, our sins, all those missed opportunities that we feel so guilty about. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, and you're here today and you recognize that you would say, Pastor Barry, I need to put my faith in God. I'm not going to invite you forward. I'm not going to have you stand but I do want to know that you're praying this with me. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you would say, I need to put my faith in God in this way. Would you just lift up your hand? And I want to include you in a prayer of receiving God to transform you from the inside out so you can make the difference that he's planned for you. I see that hand. Thank you for being so bold. We put it back down. Pray this prayer with me. Maybe you're watching online. You can pray this as well. Lord, I pray right now, Lord, Heavenly Father, forgive me of all my sins. Lord, I pray that you'd make me brand new. And then say this, Lord, I believe in you. I believe in your son who came and died for me. I place my faith in him. Now, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Make me brand new. Take away my sin. Transform my heart by your spirit so I can live and do good things for you. In the name of Jesus, we love you, Lord. Amen. Can you do me a favor and let's just give the Lord a hand. I know you got some things in your hands. Awesome. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, even if you didn't lift up your hand, I invite you to take that connection card that's on your seat, and if you would fill that out, we're not going to call you, we won't come to your door, but what we would like to do is send you some materials about the next step in your life and your walk with Christ. And then if you are new here, if you're a first-time guest, if you would take just about a few about 40 seconds before we receive the offering. Our guys are coming forward now. If you would take a few moments and fill that out, we have a no-hassle guarantee. We won't come knocking at your door. We won't come calling you, but we would like your email and send you a survey and, and find out about your experience here. And then we would like to, to physically send you a Starbucks card in the mail. So take a few moments and fill that out. Well, we're going to receive our offering this morning, and I want to thank you for being such a generous church, and about 50% of you have figured out, those of you that honor God in your giving, how to give digitally, either online or you've done so with our app, and what I would like to do is encourage you is this, is that if you set up reoccurring giving, that's really the best kind of giving. We will receive giving even the old-fashioned way that you would give this morning. 
but the best way is reoccurring giving so we know how to set our budget. One announcement I'll give before we pray is this. December 13th, just a little reminder, we'll be receiving our Christmas offering, and next week we'll let you know what the initiatives are that we feel that God's laid upon our heart that we feel will make the biggest impact for our church and for our world. Do me a favor, bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you are so good to us. Lord, you're better to us than we could ever, ever return in thankfulness. And Lord, I pray that you would take our first, take our tithes, take our tenths, take our offering, and Lord, that you would receive this, Lord, as worship to you. And Lord, we pray that you would continue to change lives through the faithfulness of your people. Lord, that there would be a connection, Lord, by your spirit between this good deed and, Lord, that you would bring glory, Lord, to your son and that we would continue to see changed children, changed teenagers, changed lives for the glory of God both here and all around the world. Lord, I pray that you'd bless each one as they honor God in this way in the name of Jesus. Now let's stand and let's receive and this worship the Lord in our giving.